when I left the church uh, in my teenage year, and it was more of a slow drifting away. I didn't have a sort of uh, moment where I said, I'm not going to, I don't consider myself Catholic. It was, a, it was a slow process. I began attending evangelical churches, still attending Mass with my parents on Sunday out of respect for them. Uh, but in terms of the, 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 the Catholic moral teachings, I don't think I ever, I, I don't think I ever rejected the Catholic moral teachings. Now, of course, in the early 1970s, uh, there wasn't the sort of deep culture war debates that we have today. So there wasn't a, a faction of Christians that believed in same-sex marriage. Uh, now, there were people that obviously believed in abortion rights, uh, and they. Um, uh, but in, in my mind, I never considered the right to abortion uh, to be a, something that was was worth defending. I now now did the issue that issue matter much to me? Not really. It actually wasn't until uh, I entered graduate school uh, that I actually changed my mind on abortion. I kind of, I was an evangelical who was a moderate on abortion, and it was a classmate of mine, an atheist believe it or not, who uh, we got into a discussion about abortion and I said, well, I believe uh, that abortion should be permissible in these circumstances. And he said, well, that's inconsistent. If the fetus is a full-fledged member of the human community, then you can't have exceptions. We don't do that for children that are already born. <laughs> and that, that totally changed my mind. In terms of the, the Catholic moral uh, tradition, or the teachings of the church, uh, I didn't, I mean, I didn't have any sort of firm convictions as an evangelical until I was, uh, I was older. Um, and eventually, uh, when I became a professor of philosophy and I began teaching courses in which uh, those issues were dealt with and I, and I wanted to expose my students to writers that defended more traditional positions, uh, the best thinkers and writers I could come up with were, were Catholic ones, uh, people that were trained in philosophy and theology that could speak at a high level. And so in a sense, I was initially drawn back to the church through those moral issues. Uh, so I became a very strong defender of the pro-life position uh, when I first began teaching in the late 1980s. And then I began to encounter more Catholic authors on other matters. Uh, I read uh, Fidi et Ratio by John Paul II, and that had a deep influence on my views on faith and reason. And then I read Evangelium Vitae, which of course is the encyclical, uh, The Gospel of Life. And so you can say that when I became an evangelical, uh, I didn't really, I didn't have a, I didn't care that much about these issues. But as I got older and I began seeing the connections between uh, living the Christian life and um, holding the correct views on these matters, I began to, you know, encounter authors that were defending those positions, and they tended to virtually all be uh, Catholic authors. I want to, at this point, you know, file a brief in defense of my evangelical friends. I have many evangelical friends, academics, uh, professors, uh, philosophers, and theologians who are pretty sophisticated on these matters and defended. Uh, defend what is equivalent to the, the Catholic view. However, the thing that really stood out to me among some of my evangelical friends was how they sort of picked and chose uh, positions that I, when I was when I uh, became older, found to be inconsistent. So. Um, uh, a lot of my evangelical friends will defend traditional marriage uh, and do so by, by citing scripture and in some ways appealing to certain understandings of natural law, but they don't take it further and, and then come to the conclusion that, okay, if in fact marriage is the joining of male and female uh, with the ultimate end to have uh, children, what does that tell us about, uh, let's say, in vitro fertilization and the kind of the sort of ideas of procreation that uh, give us a kind of manufacturing model? Uh, doesn't that, in a way, undermine the understanding of, of marriage? If the marital act is sort of not necessary for the procreation of children, uh, perhaps 
the marital act is not necessary for marriage, <laughs> right? And so, and then you begin appropriating this sort of general cultural understanding that marriage is really a kind of emotional bond uh, in, in which, uh, you know, the gender is irrelevant uh, to, to the union. I'll, I'll tell you a, a, a story that I, I, I think will sort of drive home, I think, the problem with a kind of sola scriptura understanding of moral questions. We had, uh, in 2006, the meeting of the Evangelical Theological Society in Washington, D.C., and I was the chair of, of, of that meeting. So my job was to accept and reject proposals for papers, and I think we had almost 800 uh, submissions, and I had to choose maybe 600. And I had no staff. It was basically me going through them, and I had a few graduate assistants. But we had one proposal for an evangelical defense of same-sex marriage. And I wound up accepting that paper, uh, not because I agreed with it. Obviously, there were many papers that I accepted that I didn't agree with. And I understood that you know a vast majority of people at this meeting would not like that paper. But my thinking was, ETS's statement of belief consisted only of sola scriptura, or the belief that the Bible is the infallible Word of God and the doctrine of the Trinity, and that was it. And I thought, he's giving, he's going to try to give a biblical argument for same-sex marriage. I don't think there is one that's very good, but we'll let him have at it. It's, a, it's an academic meeting, make your case, and I'm sure there'll be people in the audience that will challenge him, and that's the whole purpose of an academic meeting, right? For people to be able to even discuss controversial things. And after the meeting, I received a number of emails complaining that I had permitted this paper to be presented, and my response was, uh, you know, it's an academic society, make your argument, right? Uh, it's because evangelicals typically do not have those resources that you can have a kind of biblical argument for uh, moral positions that we as Catholics would consider to be absolutely forbidden. So it's W.A. Criswell is an ex another example, a very conservative pastor of First Baptist of Dallas, one of the largest churches in America supported abortion rights. And his argument was this, when God created Adam, he breathed into him a soul. And so the soul is equivalent to breath. And so the child is not a person until it breathes at birth. This was a common position among a lot of evangelicals. Now, later on, after the 1970s and more evangelicals become pro-life, um, positions like Criswell's become a very minor, minority uh, viewpoint. But you see what's going on here is that uh, a pro-life Christian can read the Bible and say, well, look, uh, uh, you know, Jesus, uh, the, the pre-birth Jesus stirred in the womb, right? Uh, so therefore, the soul is present then, whereas someone like Criswell says, oh, well, look, it says in the book of Genesis, the soul you know, uh, appears when there's breath, and so it's when the child has breath, right? So you see here, you can easily get, I wouldn't say easily, but I do think you can sort of see how one can take the same scriptural data and come up with uh, radically different conclusions on moral issues. Unless you have the sort of philosophical anthropology by which to interpret scripture, you, that's possible. Um, not too long ago, Nicholas Walterstorff, uh, a longtime a professor at Yale, a well-known member of the Christian Reformed Church, um, and a very traditional Christian came out in favor of same-sex marriage, and he offered a biblical defense of it. And uh, it seems to me that Waldersdorf's arguments aren't very good, uh, but they're not totally crazy on one level, right? You can see how a particular hermeneutic, uh, let's say if you take the view that sort of, uh, you know, sort of cultural... Uh, progress can help us interpret the Bible, you can get something like that. So uh, one thing that I, that I really appreciate about the Catholic Church is that not only does the Church have a firm and sophisticated uh, and clearly articulated view of the moral life, it also has a clear understanding of doctrinal development. And so it isn't as if it's sort of this totally stodgy <laughs> view, right? It also tries to incorporate as best it can uh, or tries to uh, account for or answer uh, changes in the culture while at the same time 
staying true to uh, its doctrinal principles.